Hi guys, welcome. Today we're going to wrap up our section on wool. And we're going to start sort of with other wool. So in our previous lesson, we went over coating fabrics uh, as well as suiting fabrics, um, which really um, is the bulk of our wool fabric community, especially for wovens. Um, and again, we'll pick up back with a lot more um, popular wools when we get to knits, as it's a very popular uh, fiber to use for knitting, knitting sweaters. It's very warm. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, other wools that don't fit into the category of either coating fabrics or suiting fabrics. And there's a few of them. We're just going to sort of wrap it up. And then we're going to talk about some of the other uh, specialty wools out there. So other animals besides sheep that we can get wools from. So let's begin. Other wools. So we're going to start with um, two very similar fabrics, cavalry twill and whipcord. So I have cavalry twill up here and this is whipcord down here. Um, as you can see, they're very similar. Um, their main difference, I mean, they're both very uh, strong, durable um, twill fabrics that have their history in being used for uniforms or work clothing or riding uh, outfits or hunting outfits, um, really any garment that needs to be quite strong. Um, as of course, wool is quite strong. They're made from uh, typically worsted yarns, but thicker, stronger worsted yarns. Um, they're typically moderate to, to heavier in weight. I mean, they're not super thick like coating fabrics, um, but they're a lot thicker than um, their sort of relative gabardine, which is another twill wool. Um, because of course, gabardine's more for suits and dress outfits. Uh, cavalry twill and whipcord are really, they're just strong. They're very durable. Uh, they're made uh, to be used in clothing that people need to use. Uh, for, again, um, specific situations that are going to take a lot of uh, abrasion, a lot of beating, a lot of use, and still hold up to that. They can hold up to friction, they can hold up to tension, um, all sorts of different things like that. So they're very strong, um, kind of workhorse fabrics. Um, and again, they're both made out of twill, which of course makes sense because twill is our strongest weave. Uh, cavalry twill, really the way you tell them apart um, it's, again, very subtle, and if you are kind of caught in the middle, you can sort of be excused. But cavalry twill here kind of has its twill almost in pairs. You can see the sort of pairs of twill diagonal ribbings um, coming down. And whipcord, of course, is just one singular strong uh, twill pattern coming down. So, again, it, they're very close, but um, li that little subtle difference in them in, in, the, tw in the twill weave pattern. Um, typically, of course, they can be uh, dyed any color, um, but you're typically going to see them sort of in colors where you would see them in uniform. So kind of like your khakis, your grays, kind of maybe a, um, a, a sort of darker green. But of course, you can dye them any color that you would like. Chalet. So chalet is probably one of the more lovely um, wool fabrics. And we can find this fabric today in many fibers, but originally it was made out of wool. Um, and it's sometimes a silk wool blend, but it's always soft, thin, uh, woven into a plain weave with worsted yarn. So because it's so fine, of course, we have to create it with our worsted yarns, which again are a little bit finer, a little bit thinner than our woolen yarns because they are combed uh, nicely before spinning and then spun quite tightly and compactly. Um, Shelly is often printed, so as you can see here in the picture, it actually probably was one of the original fabrics to have the paisley pattern in it. Um, but we can see, of course, paisley everywhere, and we don't necessarily need our Shelly to be printed. Come solid if we would like, um, striped as well, or whatever we would like. But we do tend to see it printed fairly often. Um, it's very soft and flowing and it's thin and delicate, and it can be almost semi-sheer at time because of its thinness. Crepe. So crepe fabric is very popular because of its lovely springy drape. It has um, kind of a lot of personality in how it falls. It has a lot of lovely movement, a lot of bounce to it. 
Um, and it can be made out of many different fibers. Um, however, I put it in wool because personally, I think that wool crepes are the most lovely crepes. Um, basically, crepe fabric gets its characteristics from the yarns used to weave it. So again, that's why we can get it in many different fibers. Um, we typically uh, just spin the yarn in a very particular way. So when we spin crepe yarns, um, we spin it in one direction and then another direction, and they're very tightly twisted. So again, when we're typically spinning fiber into yarn, we typically just spin in one sort of direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, or as we would say, an S twist or a Z twist. Um, and, but with crepe, we sort of switch. We go one way, and then we go the other way, and then we go one way, and then we go the other way. And what it produces is a yarn that's not exactly straight. It's, it's kind of uh, curly or kinky. Um, and when we weave it, and, and typically crepe is woven in uh, a plain weave, um, we kind of get this little bumpy, very subtly bubbly texture. And when you look very closely, you can kind of see the yarns kind of not quite going straight, they kind of go up and down and up and down. They're not exactly straight like you would see in your normal sort of uh, plain weaves, especially with, you know, a knot with a non-crepe yarn. They go very straight, um, very uniform. Um, but again, our, our crepe yarns, they have that little bit of extra personality and kind of kink around and kind of bubble up a little bit, giving us a sort of, it's very subtle, it's not super rough, but it's just kind of a little bit pebbly. Um, and you can, again, when you look very close, you can kind of see those yarns kind of doing their own thing, uh, going in every direction, not really going completely straight and uniform with one another. Um, again, typically, it's usually woven in with a plain weave, but we can see um, uh, varieties of crepe with uh, twills or other weaves. Again, a crepe fabric is really any fabric made with these crepe yarns, whether it be wool, whether it be silk, whether it be whatever it is. Um, but again, we see it probably most often with wool. And again, like I said, in my personal opinion, I like crepe, wool crepes the best. There also should be a little hat here on top of that E. But again, I'm not so good with PowerPoint and um, accents. Next we have wool satin. And uh, so again, most of the time when we say satin, we associate it with a silk uh, fabric. But as we saw with cotton sateen, uh, a satin can be really any fiber fabric, uh, so long as it's woven with the satin weave. And again, just like we went over with the cotton sateens, the satin weave floats yarns either in the warp or weft direction um, over many of its uh, sort of partner yarns. So we can see an example here. We have this long warp thread that's being floated over so many of these weft threads, and then finally it just kind of ducks under one. Uh, same here. We see it float, 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 duck under one. Float, 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 duck under one, float, float, float. So, and again, because we have these sort of long stretches of undisturbed yarns, it enhances the, uh, any sort of natural luster that the fiber the yarns might have. Uh, so that's why we typically associate satins with being kind of shiny. Um, again, uh, this is a very beautiful fabric, a very beautiful weave. Uh, but its construction is really tailored toward beauty and aesthetic um, because we're floating so many, and especially this example, a lot of times we'll have satin weaves where we don't float over quite so many wefts or quite so many partner yarns, um, but especially something that might look like this is very weak and it, it's prone to snag. Um, and again, it's really for its aesthetic purposes because it leaves the fabric rather weak. Um, but again, we typically use satins for more dressier, sort of formal fabrics that aren't going to be having to hold up to the rigors of, um, you know, uh, more, let's say, like workloads or things like that, more difficult use. Um, wool satins like this, we can have wool satins on their own, but very, very often you'll see uh, them blended uh, with either synthetic or silk fibers to enhance the luster. Uh, and also the drape. So here we can see it's pretty soft, um, has this nice sort of dull sheen. 
Now this here, uh, this specific fabric here, as I was researching, it's mostly wool, but has a little bit of rayon in it. Again, to add to that shine, add to that sort of soft drape, uh, so on and so forth. But we can get wool satins that are just wool. And again, when we go move on to our next category, our specialty fibers, um, we can see that there are a lot of specialty wool fibers that are much more lustrous than our typical sheep's wool. So we can get wool satins that are just wool, but if we use, oh, say a cashmere um, or uh, something else or a camel, we're going to get that natural luster without having to add silk or uh, synthetic fibers anyway. We just use the, n the natural luster of uh, the animal wool. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about specialty wools. So again, all of these wools, um, again, typically come from uh, sheep. There are many different breeds and kinds of sheep uh, that we get wool from. Um, we're probably most commonly uh, uh, familiar with the Merino sheep. It produces a very fine quality wool. And again, there's many numerous different types of breeds of sheep that give us uh, wools and gives us uh, that have different sort of characteristics that we like. But in this section, I want to focus on the animals that are not sheep that we get wool from. And this is a fun section because we get to look at a lot of fun little fluffy animals. Um, so I also want to reiterate as we sort of ooh and on the cute little fluffy animals that none of these animals have to be killed to harvest their wool. That is absolutely not true. It never happens. Um, they are shorn, uh, which means they get a, a little haircut. We collect the wool, um, and actually even a couple of these, they don't even do that. Uh, the animals naturally shed, and uh, people collect the wool afterwards. Um, that's really only applicable, I think, to the very last animal in this category, but we'll go one by one. So again, none of these animals are harmed in the, in the cultivation or harvesting of their wool. Many of them actually um, are bred, so the more domestic versions are bred not to shed their coats, so if they're not shorn, it can be quite detrimental to their health. Alpacas, these are cute little fluffy guys. Um, these fluffy animals look a lot like llamas and indeed they're very, very closely related to the llama. Um, they were bred just like the llama by the Andean people um, from the same wild ancestor. However, um, in breeding the animals out, um, the Andean peoples bred the llama really as a beast of burden um, and saved the alpaca for meat and wool. Um, so the wool of the alpaca is, is much fluffier uh, and finer and, and much more conducive to be made into uh, yarns and fibers than the llama. Um, I don't, I've never really heard of llama fur. I don't even know if you can really do it, but alpaca fur is pretty famous. We love our alpaca yarns. They're very nice and warm. Um, they are stronger, finer, and more lustrous than sheep's wool. And they're so cute. Look at them. Uh, Vicuna and Wanako. So uh, this, these are the two wild relatives in which the, both the llama and alpaca um, were pretty much bred from. Uh, and these remain wild animals um, in the Andes, native to the Andes. And they offer some of the most expensive and prized wool around. Uh, this guy, I know they look very similar, but they are two different species. This guy is the vicuna. This guy is the wananco. And uh, the vicuna actually arguably has some of the most expensive, most prized wool. Um, it's the finest wool just by like sheer diameter of the hair. Um, and but both of them uh, offer wool that is incredibly soft very, very warm, very insulative, and very fine. Um, so super high quality wool and very, very expensive. It's very expensive because again, these guys are not domesticated. So you kind of have to go out in the wild and, and, and deal with an undomesticated animal. Um, again, they're not harmed uh, when the animal is shorn. Of course, um, it, it really makes no sense to do that because um, if you shear it, once and keep it alive, you can shear it again. It, it, and we don't really eat a lot of their meat. So um, again, they're not harmed when it's shorn. However, as you can see, they're not super fluffy and their fur does not grow super fast. So you can only shear them maybe once every three to four years. 
Um, whereas with sheep and other animals, you shear them, you know, once, maybe twice a year. Um, and that adds to their wool being very, very expensive. <laughs> They're so cute, too. Angora rabbit, look at this thing. Um, this adorable bunny has been selectively bred to produce very, very soft fur, fur that can be shorn and used in wool production. Uh, its wool is so super soft, softer even than uh, cashmere, but it's not really that strong. Um, so it doesn't create super durable fabrics. It's really, it's, it's claim to fame is just simply how soft it is. It's not super inflative. It's not super strong. It's just super fluffy, super soft. Um, because it's fairly expensive and, you know, a a rabbits are very small, <laughs> even though he's really working overtime to produce his fur. Um, it's usually blended with other fibers uh, to give a little bit more softness to wool um, or, or again, other, other fibers that need a little bit of softening to them or people, you know, what's wrong with being soft? Um, it's, it's so stupid. <laughs> okay, um, Bactrian camel. So camel's wool is, is actually pretty prevalent, especially in suiting and also coating fabric. So you'll see um, the uh, introduction of camel's wool actually pretty frequently in suitings and coatings. Uh, most of the time you'll see it blended with sheep's wool, again, because it is very expensive. Um, and uh, we only get wool, so wool used for clothing only comes from the Bactrian camel, which is pictured here. Now the Bactrian camel is the camel from the Gobi Desert and it has two humps, um, as opposed to the other camel that we're probably a little bit even more familiar with, which is the dromedary camel, which really comes from the Arab world and only has that one hump. Um, the wool from this camel is very soft, it's lustrous and lightweight. Uh, and again, it's often, uh, and most often seen blended with other wools. When we do see it, uh, especially on its own, uh, camel's wool is not often dyed and is usually seen in sort of its natural color, which is, as you can see here, kind of um, light brown or dark tan, kind of tawny-ish color. Cashmere. So cashmere um, is probably one of the most famous specialty wools, um, and it comes from uh, this guy, which is the cashmere goat. And as you can see, he's super fluffy and you can already see the sort of luster in his coat, how pretty and shiny. Um, it's some of the warmest wools around. Um, so this is again, uh, sort of very much like the Vicuna wool where it's super fine, lustrous, uh, and warm. Um, even lightweight fabrics made from cashmere can be incredibly insulating. However, it's, uh, even though it has these wonderful insulative properties, we really see it as sort of a luxury fabric that just adds a, a super, super softness or luster uh, to the fabrics. Um, but again, we're going to see it in, more so in uh, winter and fall lines, uh, sweaters and things like the things that where you do need to keep warm because even if you have a nice lightweight cashmere, very thin, it still is super warm, so it's not appropriate for warmer climates or warmer weather because you'll just become too hot in it. It just does too good a job insulating. Um, and that probably is due to the fact that this goat originally comes from the northern Indian province of Kashmir. It's where the goat and the fagmir, uh, fabric gets its name. Um, and that northern province really is... Uh, um, has, uh, is part of the Himalayas uh, where these goats live. So they live up in very, very high mountains in very, very cold weather. Um, so again, they have to grow fur that is, keeps them quite warm. Next is mohair. And this is another goat. It looks very similar to the cashmere goat, but he's got a little bit of a curlier coat where the cashmere goat is sort of flowy and lustrous. Um, this guy's got a little bit more curl, a little bit more bounce to his uh, coat here. Um, and it comes from not the mohair goat, but the angora goat. Don't confuse him with the angora rabbit. Um, legally, uh, companies are required to say whether fur comes from the angora rabbit or the angora goat. So in that, you know, fiber content, it has to say. 
Um, sometimes people don't do it though, uh, but they, they should be required to do it or they are required to do it. So they, they should be saying, oh, this is Angora goat or this is Angora rabbit. It shouldn't just say Angora. Um, unlike other wool fibers uh, that we sort of looked at in this category that can be um, you know, shorn and then, you know, made into knits, made into wovens, made into all different types of fabric. Uh, mohair kind of is used to create a one distinctive fabric. Now, of course, we can use it in all different types of fabric, but if I specifically say mohair fabric, um, a very specific type of fabric should be coming to mind, much more so than if I say cashmere or, um, you know, camel, because again, we can knit that, we can weave that, we can, we can do pretty much anything with that. And again, we can do pretty much anything with this, but what we typically do is we make mohair fabric. Um, and mohair fabric is quite distinctive. It typically has a long, very shaggy, fluffy pile. It can be knit or woven, um, but in either case, that sort of shaggy, fluffy pile is present. Um, today, because real mohair is very expensive, most of the mohair that you see in stores is not made from the Angora goat. It's made from synthetic fibers instead. Boohoo. Quiviet. Now this is a very interesting one um, and it's, it's, it's probably the rarest specialty fiber that we can see. Um, it's not often used in commercial production. Um, but I thought I'd mention it because he's a very handsome musk ox over here. Um, and basically, Quiviet it refers to not just the fur or wool of the musk ox, but specifically the softer kind of downier undercoat uh, of the musk ox. So not all of his fur is conducive to be spun into yarns and, or woven or knit, only the, the underneath coat. Um, and, and, and specifically the underneath coat that they develop in the winter time. Now they live, these mux osks live in very cold temperatures within the Arctic Circle. Um, and in the springtime, what they do is they shed their undercoat for a sort of lighter summer coat. And the Inuit people traditionally went around and collected this shed fur to spin into an incredibly strong, warm fiber that you can knit or weave into ex extremely warm, strong fabrics. Um, it's mostly just a sort of traditional fabric uh, made and worn by the Inuit peoples, but you can find it um, you, if you want to go out and buy some. Um, it is sold in parts of Alaska and Canada, but again, is not widely used in the commercial fashion industry. So that wraps up our specialty wools, and uh, in doing so, also concludes our section on wool. Uh, I hope you had a fun time learning a little bit more about our wool fabrics, and especially the animals that wool comes from. Uh, it's always nice to sort of look at fun, fluffy animals. Um, next, we're going to uh, take a look at silk fabrics. Um, so one of the most beautiful sections of fabrics. Um, and, uh, we'll wrap that up, uh, probably next week, um, and move on to some sketching. Uh, but again, I, I want just to mention that the second collection project is up in the assignment section. So take a look, uh, for all the details. It's pretty much the same as the first, but has the due date. And again, I'm looking for, um, improvements. And especially, as I said in uh, a previous video, I think one of the, things that everybody really needed a little bit of improvement on is knowing your fabric. So hopefully after this video series, you'll be much more prepared uh, to choose and talk about your fabrics for your collection. All right. Bye-bye, guys. I'll see you next week. Have a great weekend.